Okay, good afternoon everyone. I think it's time for us to start. Uh, last session for today. I hope you've been having a good reInvent conference. The topic we have today is uh, really about business agility, but the special emphasis is on how cloud enabling the enterprise is the way to achieve the agility. And I'm going to make special emphasis again on cloud enabling the enterprise. It's more than just migrating the applications and the infrastructure elements. We'll try to illustrate this with some very specific, uh, very interesting examples. But again, it's about the enterprise, not just their IT portfolio. Uh, what I'm going to cover is some of the imperatives that you know, we see, uh, we in Wipro see enterprises have the expectations they have for cloud. We'll go through these three interesting modules. Please don't think of them as necessarily being a sequence of steps, but they actually cover the elements of an enterprise that really need enabling. So discovery, migration, and then managed services and monitoring. And we'll certainly start out actually with some case studies and interleave with a lot of best practices. We will keep time for questions should you have any at the end. Uh, first, very quickly, this is what we see uh, enterprises actually across the world, not just here in North America and Europe, including in the emerging countries. The number one reason is no longer the infrastructure cost takeout. It's actually the greater agility the business has as a result. Mind you, not just the development life cycle, not just the deployment life cycle, but how fast they can realize business processes how fast these business processes can be altered, how fast they can onboard new employees, how fast those new employees can be trained on the new business processes. All those are critical elements of agility. And certainly the integrity of the solutions, you know, the accelerated development life cycle with DevOps, the opportunity for feedback and prototyping, all these result in better integrity and closer fit to what the business needs. Number one reason we see that enterprises are actually going to cloud in 2015. Next is, of course, there's a lot of collaboration, not just collaboration within the enterprise, not just between business and IT, a lot of collaboration across the enterprise, not just from business perspective, even IT. I spent some time, as I'm sure all of you did in Hall C, where incredible innovation is coming from startups and relatively small companies. That's another aspect of collaboration that now they are enabled to do. Earlier it, was, earlier it was very difficult. And certainly cost reduction is temptation. It's, uh, perhaps it's one time. But another benefit that they see and another appeal that cloud has is they get a great degree of transparency in the chargebacks. You know, with the AWS account set up, you can link them to either an application or a cluster of applications. There's incredible clarity now in what chargeback they get and why. Uh, from our experience in helping these enterprises move to the cloud, again, not just their applications and infrastructure, all aspects, the three important modules. We'll spend time explaining these in context of both the examples and overall. Uh, how fast you can identify those IT elements to be migrated, that's important. Then certainly you want to use experience and assets, and you want to accelerate the migration. It's not always possible to automate it completely. We'll give you some very interesting cases where lift and shift would defeat the purpose. There's a whole bunch of consolidation, what we call in Wipro cloudification of exposing APIs of legacy applications as a result. So certainly you can't automate it all, but you can certainly accelerate the process. And very interesting, this is coming back to again the business agility and how it's achieved. A very high degree of automation, once the movement is over, on an ongoing basis to manage and monitor the enterprise landscape. This is of course post-migration, and that's why I'm emphasizing it's cloud enabling, not just migration. So we'll take, spend some time going through these three uh, pretty large case studies that we have. There are some important nuances of each that I'll call out as well. Uh, even in 2015, with a whole bunch of you know, massively open online courses, 
there are still a lot of providers, you know, content providers, in this case, this education services provider based on the East Coast. They really have, you know, a lot of data, a lot of content. So secure access, high-speed access to this content was very important. A lot of very nice innovative applications that they had, continually trying to repurpose the content, constantly curating the content to narrowcast it to particular you know, educational institutions or consumers of the published content. Therefore, the relevant AWS modules, as you would expect, in fact, this was the previous session, uh, you know, the Direct Connect platform from AWS really allows not just high-speed access, but also a lot of control. Security was also very important, as I said, not just the content and the data that they have, but wanting to expose access to this in a controlled way to monetize all the content that they have. So very interesting that this customer, much like the examples that I called out of why enterprises are wanting to move to cloud, is a great degree of speed that they got as a result in very innovative applications that expose packages or fragments of this content or clusters of this content available to their enterprise customers. So again, security first, second, high-speed access to this content, and third was, of course, great degree of acceleration in how fast they were able to make new applications, new services available to users of this content. So certainly they benefited. As you can see, they moved up a whole bunch of savings of the infrastructure, but again, access to a wider number of customers, uh, more chunks in which their content could be made available, that's really what cloud provided them. So again, migrating really was the infrastructure savings, but cloud enabling got them to perhaps, may not be new business models, but more effective ways in which their enterprise assets could be accessed, sold, and monetized. Go on to the next example. This is a bank. And for a bank, actually, for one of the important considerations for them was not just the infrastructure expense, huge amount of expense, actually, in uh, you know, off-the-shelf uh, third-party licenses. So this was a big bugbear. Their expectation was actually to consolidate some of those licenses, really. right? So it's not just the infrastructure expense. Clearly, also, as a result of moving to cloud, they wanted to make sure that applications could be updated faster. So certainly speed, velocity, agility were very important. Now what was quite critical is to look not just at you know, the infrastructure, not just at the applications, but also at the databases. And as I said, resist the temptation of trying to do this fast, trying to automate this, and do what is lift and shift. So it would have been very tempting, would have been very fast to do, but not so easy as a result to get that cost spend reduced, not quite so easy to get the release cycle reduced. So as a result, we actually looked at the patterns of the applications themselves, usage characteristics, and looked at very tough decisions. For instance, in certain cases, consolidate some applications. In certain cases, retire some applications. In a few cases, we actually decided to transform those applications to actually use an open source component or open source platform instead. So naturally, that takes a little longer. It was well worth it, because some of the benefits this customer got were really not just license saving. And some of you know this. Uh, you know, Several of the open source products are now having innovation that regular ISVs struggle to provide. So they really got a lot of speed in downstream application development not just the cost saving of COTS products replaced with uh, open source. So a lot of components of allowing innovation. When we actually took the decision to either consolidate or transform, this got the bank a whole bunch of benefits, again relating to business agility, because they got more standardized processes. You know, different products of the banks, whether it is CASA or cards processing or mortgage, there were many elements that actually could be standardized. So you see business agility arose from not lift and shift cloud migration, 
but understanding really what the downstream benefits or triggers for business agility were, and they were kind of non-standard or not very uniform processes. So this standardization gave them the additional business agility benefit. And by the way, since they were anyway moving to cloud, workload variations, which as, as true of a bank as anybody else, became very much simpler to manage. So throughout, you see in this case too, it's not just the infrastructure saving and the court's license saving, but again, the speed that resulted from standardizing products and the speed at innovation that resulted from inserting uh, you know, newer platforms. I'm going to go on to the third, and this is again particularly chosen because it was triggered by a very different perspective. This is now a company actually headquartered in Europe, but operate across the world, and they've got unique needs in each market, 20 major markets across the world, uh, huge diversity in the applications they support, and the usual suspects of you know, uh, enterprise applications uh, ERP products, uh, sales and marketing systems, and so on. But more important, it was not, again, the infrastructure costs alone. It was actually the inefficiency and extreme latency each time headquarters or a region needed to make changes. Those changes were sometimes dictated by local market needs, local regulator needs, what CHQ wanted to proliferate across the organization, so that is where the real challenge to the CIOs were. Then, of course, the cost of managing this diversity, not just infrastructure, but also headcount, uh, license, uh, the diversity, the need for consolidating data, and so on for reporting. So that was the real challenge of this company. I'm sure many of you are also either working for or supporting clients who have simply because of this diversity the issue of lack of agility which has to be addressed. Again, not a good candidate for lift and shift directly because you won't necessarily get the order of magnitude of speed changes they want. So the solution we crafted for this customer naturally was very different. We started first with again business process standardization. Then we started looking at elements or foundation elements supporting these business processes. Uh, notification, workflow, interfacing to the various systems of record. And we put this base platform atop AWS. As a result, this base platform represents the element on which foundation services are built on. And clearly, this allowed us to be able to support markets across the globe as well as a platform to have standardized processes atop systems of record that sometimes were different. By the way, in the whole process of this base platform, we built it actually on open source again. This was another contribution to license savings, but the dramatic business agility benefit for this client actually came from standardized processes again. So again, pattern, not lift and shift, look at the real pain points of the organization, examine what is actually going to drive them to business agility, and also recognize the additional benefits that flow to them of not just infrastructure savings from cloud, but a lot of the support headcount simply because of, again, standard processes, and a lot of the self-service and automation that AWS platforms give. So again, really, we try to characterize this, and our client calls this out as really business process as a service because they understood that there's now a catalog of very standardized business processes that any of their 20 operating units across the globe could use. Certain variations were possible, but the underlying platform to enable the standardization was built on open source, which gave them a benefit as well. And incrementally now, as each license approaches end of life for systems of record, it's quite easy for them to get additional savings by moving some of those out of their landscape. So again, three cases to illustrate for you across completely different segments, uh, consumer package goods, banking, and educational services, where and how business agility is coming from cloud 
never blind lift and shift, not necessarily automating all the migration, but examining what are the hurdles, roadblocks, or constraints that would prevent the customer from being really agile in all respects. By the way, the other side benefits came from, as I said again, the other elements of what an enterprise has, onboarding new staff, training their staff, all these again with cloud allows them to do it in a very efficient way. And these are ongoing aspects to agility that are quite critical. Similarly, monitoring, providing chargeback to business functions, uh, you know, constantly looking at where and how to instrument for any changes in business process, landscape, regulation and local market needs was quite easy to do as a result of moving to cloud. So to take away then across not just these three examples, but our whole body of experience, the whole bunch of situations that have struck us as being very appropriate to use cloud enabling as the pattern to get the enterprise benefits. So we get several situations, for instance, that uh, you know, a business unit has to be divested. Sometimes the opposite happens, that regulator and market conditions dictate growing or buying some other, some other customer's portfolio. Then there are certainly reasons for uh, standardization. We gave some examples of software licensing. We've come across a huge catalog of service situations where cloud enabling actually helps them achieve the benefits. For the technology options for the enablement itself, not just, again, the application and the infrastructure elements, whole bunch of benefits result from understanding which applications should be modernized and not just put onto cloud, uh, benefits that result on moving from more expensive hardware platforms or more expensive uh, you know, software platforms, uh, database, middleware, and so on. And these are the technology options that get them those benefits. And finally, as we introduced in the, in, to start with, it is the methods and assets that enable identifying and guiding that enterprise how to make the choice. We'll spend some time on this. Insightix is a set of capabilities that our company has developed, having done this so often, about how to understand elements and characteristics of those elements that help you make the choice. Again, retire an application, transform the application, keep it as it is and execute a lift and shift. And then again, to migrate the applications themselves, where and how appropriate automation is needed. We'll also spend some time on the ongoing savings that comes from managing the services once the landscape is on cloud, uh, monitoring and you know, dealing with uh, tickets, chargeback, and the ongoing operation of that landscape on cloud. So first is uh, you know, the opportunities that arise, and these are typical numbers. Please go and don't get you know, uh, taken away. It's not an order of magnitude reduction, but we've come across a large number of cases enterprises with more than a thousand applications, not in thousands, but more than a thousand, we have often been able to actually bring it down to a few hundred. So, you know, 25 to 35 percent savings in the number of applications, not because of a mechanical lift and shift, but looking at characteristics of the applications, discussing with the IT organization where and how, for instance, Reduction in applications by retiring some, consolidating others, transforming a few. This is actually, as you can imagine, getting you an order of magnitude of not just cost saving, but a lot of business agility. So a lesson here is please don't do a blind lift and shift. Tempting though it is, quick though it appears, it doesn't give you the real bang for the buck that enterprises have encountered. Certainly complexity and risk, there are sometimes uh, systems that, you know, literally we've come across, they're actually for the senior vice president's reporting systems. Nobody knows too much about them. Those are actually worth looking into because very often, very simple changes in reporting systems will achieve the goal rather than keeping applications and moving them over. So uh, reducing variations is also very important. After all, that is really what AWS promises standardizing the stack, both the 
Intel environments, uh, largely Windows and Linux, that gives a lot of benefit simply because we've reduced the variations in the platforms. I've also mentioned already about simplifying those business processes and as much as possible, reducing the process variations across markets, across product lines and so on. This is what really contributes to business agility. So it's not just the life cycle of software development, it's the ongoing execution of business processes. Try to standardize them as much as possible. It takes a little extra effort. You need to have a little more characteristics about the applications. This is a cue to my next slide, which is a structured way to find those characteristics such that collaboratively with the client business staff, we can identify the choices of which ones to move, consolidate, retire, and so on. So again, this is the discovery and assessment stage. Again, I was mentioning in Hall C, we came across a pretty cool company, ATA Data. It's an any to any transformation uh, shop. And they also have pretty cool tools that help an enterprise or a system integrator to make those choices. So Insightix is what we use in our, uh, our own customer base. Uh, we really look at characteristics of both infrastructure and applications. You see the two diagonal circles there. And we'll grade these application and infrastructure elements on various criteria. And as a result, look at how and what the disposition of that infrastructure element or application element should be. And as a result, it is actually you know, not really an automated process. But as I said, the value is coming from linking it to the agility needs and business pain points of the enterprise client. This is a very quick schematic which shows you some of the enablers and characteristics of each of the elements. On the left is data center or infrastructure elements. In the center, you see the collaboration platforms and the middleware. And then, of course, you look at the applications. Depending on categories, there are certainly the traditional commercial packages, custom built, and the newer uh, mobile and uh, SaaS kind of uh, applications. So we look at what these are. Uh, through experience, we have developed patterns and trends for which are appropriate to consolidate based again on the platform and the vintage and how many users there are and the profile of those users. These lead to heuristics that suggest you know, a retirement decision and so on. And certainly we look at characteristics such as the workload of the application, dependencies of the applications, uh, what, as I said, the profile of users are, uh, seasonality and workload variations, all these help. So these are scope areas of the assessment. And then once we finish the discovery or this, if you like, inventory and refining the characteristics, then we actually come up with the disposition decisions. Uh, as you see here in four buckets, uh, you know, persist with it, perhaps continue investing it after the migration. Then there are migration that is pretty substantial transformations necessary and hopefully a fairly large bucket where after fair disposition, sometimes a pilot project to validate with the users that the consolidated ap application is okay, then a elimination because this gives the benefits if you recollect over a thousand getting down to perhaps 500 or 600. Pretty substantial savings can result and more important, actually achieve the business agility the enterprise wants. Again, not through the development life cycle, but also through deployment and execution of those processes. So this is uh, an involved process. It can't be done by your, your IT department or by your system integrator in isolation. They will certainly use their, use their heuristics, but quite a lot of collaborative discussions are needed with representative business users, because these are pretty you know, involved decisions. It can't be done, as I said, in isolation. Then we come to the migration itself. As I said, uh, several companies have tools. Uh, we will just show you a very simple example of, uh, you know, somewhat straightforward category, but quite a popular pattern, by the way. A lot of enterprises choosing to move custom apps from, you know, uh, what I would call uh, commercial off-the-shelf vendors and then they want to move it over to open source. You know, for instance, uh, content management, a portal product. If they're actually from a LAMP stack, 
a lot of savings can result. They are not necessarily going to work the way they are working in the older environment. But again, uh, this host transformation solution allows very quick and a high degree of automation for this particular case. There are more involved cases. For instance, some enterprises have uh, portal applications with SharePoint. They also have some with uh, you know, Domino. And as a result, taking the decision on which one to go to or move both those applications over to an open source portal, fairly large degree of automation is possible once you identify features of the two platforms and how they map to the target. This is what results actually in a fairly high degree of automation in certain cases. If the migration, however, is refactoring the application, uh, relocating, for instance, some of the COBOL processing on an older system to, let's say, Java processing on a modern system, uh, parallelizing the batch streams, those become more involved, probably a lesser degree of automation is possible. So again, they call them acceleration tools rather than automation tools based on experience, based on patterns, based on workloads, and more importantly, discussion with the enterprise business users. This actually results in a combination of both experience as well as realities of each situation. Now we come to the third part. Happily, we've understood what the disposition is. We've actually done the migration. There's also, as I said, a whole lot of benefits that arise on an ongoing basis. As I said, monitoring the landscape, uh, the chargeback, the service requests that come in, also supporting functions of enabling the users constantly, right? Either for their training, onboarding new staff, cloud offers a whole bunch of benefits that again are aligned to the business agility objectives of the client. So again, we use that experience of many different situations and actually aggregated this in what we call a service next operation center. This is not just you know single pane of glass that allows you to monitor. There are several other things it does. So we will just go clockwise. We'll start with requests and support. Clearly, requests could come from business users for several different situations, uh, not just incidents and more involved enhancement and service requests. There are constantly needs that, for instance, administrators need to have about changes, knowledge that they need to have. So the whole bunch of request and support needs come in. Again, pretty common pattern, aggregated and implemented as a module in this cloud operation center. It makes the staff a lot more productive. And this is, of course, after they you know, go through the initial familiarization of this new platform in their organization compared to the traditional data center. Then we come to the provision and configure. I'm sure all of you are quite familiar. There's a plethora of tasks that's involved. Each time, for instance, something moves from dev test to production, the user's privileges have to be configured. The workload has to be provisioned according to what and how uh, it has to be set up. Then a whole bunch of. Uh, you know, other features of each application in order to test. I mentioned security privileges. High degree of automation is needed. Therefore, the provision and configure module. Then on an ongoing basis, the applications and the infrastructure have to be monitored. So tracking performance, tracking, uh, you know, messages, looking at uh, ongoing tasks of uh, backups, all those are critical. And then the plan and govern, remember another aspect that a lot of enterprise customers look for is not just lower cost, but greater transparency. So the whole uh, metering, billing, and chargebacks is another module that's needed. So certainly, there are expensive products available from many you know, cloud management platforms. But based on our experience, we were able to make sure that this is interoperable. If an enterprise has some of these modules available, we can really make the whole set coexist. So this is really what the management and monitoring on an ongoing basis of that landscape allows. This is really what it looks like. Pictorially, you see it can work with not just uh, workloads on AWS, but also uh, other platforms and uh, on-prem or uh, private cloud. 
And certainly it covers uh, features such as analytics, which can correlate tickets, which can use machine learning to help the company and the administrators be quicker and sharper at looking at trends and therefore proactively uh, setting up corrective actions in future. And certainly the end-to-end -end cloud lifecycle management becomes a lot more convenient. Again, this is a critical aspect because on an ongoing basis, after all the savings have been achieved, the enterprise still must get the agility and preserve that service level, not just through the development and deployment lifecycle, but all through. Certainly this reporting and chargeback, I should mention, is becoming very important. And part of the agility advantage that a platform like this gives is that you know, a business team knows exactly how much they're going to be charged because of DevOps and you know, these new innovative products because of more standardized processes. Their inclination to fund new projects actually goes up because they've got clarity, they have the advantage of speed, they understand standardization benefits. So we see many of our customers are funding a whole bunch of new projects, typically not very large, but that's an enormous benefit because that's again testament to the agility benefits that cloud enabling has given them. They're quite confident that chargeback on an ongoing basis of all that they do, even if they have to kill the project because you know, market conditions dictate that you know, it's no longer a very useful thing to do, uh, if they also have to look forward to how fast they can train staff, after all, it's a new application anyway. That's again very convenient and very quick for them to do. So we do see a spike in new projects that are actually funded once this uh, complete infrastructure and cloud enabling is in place. So I had my eye on the clock. I think we are uh, come to the last slide. Uh, I'll be happy to take questions because we try to illustrate what clients are facing, but each of you represent also what uh, clients would like to see. So I'll be happy to take questions, and for those of you who can do so, please make time to visit us. Uh, we've got demonstrations of many of these tools. Uh, a lot of our subject matter experts who've helped these customers are also available for consultation, but I'll be happy to take questions that anybody might have.